Welcome everyone to the engineering lecture series at the University of Wisconsin Stout. Today we are joined by Kyle Niemeyer, who is coming to us from Oregon State University, uh, where he is an associate professor in the School of Mechanical, Industrial and Manufacturing Engineering. Uh, he does work in computational modeling and especially in uh, kinetic uh, chemical kinetics. Uh, and he's going to talk to us today about tackling the computational cost of modeling reacting fluids. So with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Niemeyer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I hope you can still see me when. Oh, no, I did the wrong thing. There we go. OK, and hopefully we, you can still can see still me. We can still see you at the bottom of our screen. Okay. So. I can't see anything except for what I'm presenting at the moment. So <laughs> if uh, if anybody needs to get my attention, you'll have to say something. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, like was introduced, um, my name is Kyle Niemeyer. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, both the the kind of background in in uh, modeling computational computationally modeling reacting fluid flows, specifically combustion is kind of the primary area I'm going to talk about. Um, summarize the problems uh, and then talk about some of the work that my group and I um, have been doing. Um, I shared some contact information below where you can find out a little bit more about our projects, um, both on GitHub, which I'll talk a little bit about, and then group website. I'll share this stuff at, at, again at the end too if you're curious and want to find out more. So today um, I'm going to talk, in case you know, you're wondering a little bit about some of the words that have been used like chemical kinetics, numerical combustion, I'm going to talk a little, little bit about that and discuss some of the challenges and, and why this is something that we care about. Um, and specifically, what the challenges um, are involved when we're trying to incorporate uh, specifically detailed chemical kinetics. So really detailed models for, for chemistry, um, specifically combustion, although it extends to other, other reacting flow problems as well. Um, I'll talk about some of the work that we've done to reduce the computational expense um, of, of these through a, a variety of strategies, both past and ongoing work. And then talk about some of the other projects, both related to this topic and, and others um, that are uh, going on in my, my research group. So first thing I want to acknowledge is that, you know, most of the work I'm talking about is not done by, by me at this point. Um, it's done by a variety of graduate and undergraduate students um, who are working on pretty much all totally different projects, right? We have a lot of, of um, diversity of, of projects in my group. Um, this, uh, my, these are my current students, um, includes PhD students, master students, and a handful of undergraduate students who've been working on various projects. Um, and then, you know, I have a bunch of alumni in my, from my group who also have worked on these and other projects as well. So just want to point out that none of this is really specifically my work, um, although my hand is in, is in most of it. I also want to point out that um, pretty much everything I'm going to talk about is also collaborative in some form um, with colleagues both at my university at Oregon State and at other universities. Uh, I have a, my PhD advisor is at University of Connecticut and I still have strong collaborations with a variety of folks there. Um, people at Oregon State includes other mechanical engineering professors who do more experimental work, even though I focus on computational. And then I have some newer projects which connect to folks in nuclear engineering as well. Um, I also have a variety of collaborators at, at, at other universities kind of all over the place. So pretty much everything I do is collaborative in some form. I don't have any single, you know, investigator type projects. Mostly I like to work with other people because we get to combine our, our expertise in different areas in exciting ways. Um, all the work, you know, I'm going to talk about has been pretty much all of it has been funded by by some uh, mostly federal funding agencies such as the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, as well as NASA, with some some smaller amounts of private funding in there. So my, my main point starting out here is to say that a lot of this work is not done by me specifically, and it's mostly been funded and supported by, by others as well. So um, I don't typically put very many equations in my presentations because I think unless you're actually teaching a class, it's it's usually not necessary. So this is probably I think the last equation, maybe one of the last equations I'm going to have um, very early on. But I just want to point out the challenge that that I'm most a lot of my work has has been um, aimed at addressing. And these are if you recognize one form of the Navier-Stokes equations and the, essentially the governing equations for modeling reacting fluid flows. Again, my interest has predominantly been in combustion and you know, various applications of combustion, such as energy, transportation, such as in engines, um, aerospace. Um, everything, you know, the, the reacting flow in those applications are governed by pretty much the same set of equations. You know, you might add certain terms here and there to accommodate different phenomena, um, but it all kind of comes back to this. 
Um, there's, again, various forms. This is just one sort of condensed form of these equations. Um, and obviously, these are partial time dependent, partial differential equations. Um, and the main challenge that I have worked on addressing is really only a couple of terms. These these two terms here um, in the uh, energy equation and then the uh, species, chemical species, mass conservation equations. And those two terms um, come to come back to chemical reactions. So they're not they're not going to appear if you're looking at a, f a fluid flow that doesn't have any sort of chemical reactions. But as soon as you involve reactions, right, you have species that are, you know, some fuel and oxidizer that are reacting, you have to introduce these these um, source terms that are associated with the energy release and the changing in, in species, right, as they're converting from one thing to the other. And these two little terms that don't look like much, I guess, you know, this is what they really look like. It has to do with the, the rate of reactions and the rate of species change. They can introduce a lot of computational expense, meaning um, they can take a, a problem that maybe if it were not reacting, you could run on your desktop computer, you know, given it some time to something that has to be Done, you know, thrown at much, much larger supercomputers and computing clusters. And even on those, depending on the problem, um, the simulations could, you know, without any sort of um, work at, at reducing the cost, could take an unreasonable amount of time. So those two little terms in these, in these overall kind of complicated equations can introduce a lot of computational expense. So it doesn't seem like much when you look at it from this perspective, but um, has led to quite a bit of work and, and, and years of my life. <laughs> and it's still, still a challenge. So I'll talk a little bit about, more about why why these are you know a challenge, um, and it really comes down to that that simple uh, ordinary differential equation right there, the dy dt, which is the rate of change of of species of chemical species of different molecules due to the reactions. So what is that? Where does that come from, right? If you think you know, especially if you're if you've seen a little bit about fuel and combustion, and maybe your thermodynamics class or a combustion class. Um, depends on where you might see some of this stuff, right? If you haven't gone too, into too much depth into the chemistry, then when you think about combustion, you think about fuels oxidizing, you know, burning with air or oxygen, um, well, you might think about a reaction like this, right? This is the fuel, hydrogen, plus an oxidizer, oxygen, which turns into water, right? And that's probably, for many of you, the, the you know, the furthest you've gone, it's, that's your fuel, you know, your combustion reaction, right? Well, in reality, this isn't actually how these things react with each other. You know, you might have, a very, very small chance of the hydrogen molecule and the oxygen mo molecule actually hitting each other and reacting and turning right into water. But the chances of that reaction truly occurring are pretty are pretty tiny. So in reality, well, first we should balance it for stoichiometry. Um, but in reality, this actually happens through a much more complicated process, right? Instead, we get things like hydrogen breaking apart into H radicals. We get oxygen breaking apart into O radicals. And then these things start to attack other, you know, the molecules. We get all these other things that form, all these other reactions that are occurring. So the previous reaction might be the overall process, and that might show, you know, what you start with and then mostly what you end with. But the actual dynamics of how it gets there are much more complicated. And so this starts to, you know, maybe you start to see where, where some of the computational complexity appears because not only do you have to account for tracking all of these additional species, you know, you have to have equations for each one of them and you have to keep track of the, the rate of, of reaction of all these reactions, which contribute to the rate of change of all the species. Now, this looks like a lot, right? There's a number of reactions here, a number of species. I've probably even left some out just for, for ease of showing stuff on the screen. Um, and hydrogen is one of the simplest molecules that we can, you know, that we consider in combustion. It's just two, you know, uh, two hydrogen atoms reacting with oxygen. And most practical fuels right, related to combustion, such as, you know, gasoline, diesel, jet fuels, those are way more complicated. Even methane, CH4 is much more complicated, right? So, um, so I guess I'm going to take a step back here for a second and say that, you know, what we end up with is due to this chemistry, we end up with one differential equation for each one of the chemical species, each one of the molecules that is, in, is involved. And so we have to solve that system of differential equations, which looks like this, um, at every time and at every spatial location. So that's where this, this computational complexity starts to starts to come from. Um, and you know, there's there's other ways that you can do this, but this is the typical the typical approach. So you end up with this large number of independent ordinary differential equations, and you know when you start to get into things like turbulence and turbulent combustion, you can end up with even more due to the various ways that we model the interaction between turbulence and chemistry. I'm not going to talk too much about turbulence; it, it just overcomplicates the the story a little bit.
So what this actually looks like when it comes down to it are, you know, this is a, a an elementary uh, reaction, um, the form where you have a certain species in the in the reactants that turn into certain species in the products. Um, that reaction rate is is proportional to the collision frequency, and therefore is also kind of proportional to the the species concentrations. So we end up with this ability to calculate a reaction rate um, with some temperature dependent rate constant, and then um, the product of the species. Uh, the species pro uh, concentrations. So these reaction rates depend on on the the amount of the uh, the chemical species. Um, so for hydrogen uh, H plus O H plus H O two turning into hydroxyl, this is sort of what that that looks like. So we end up with this sort of having to calculate these rates for every reaction, and then combining all of these reaction rates to turning into calculating the the product or um, uh, the the time rate of change of all the species which turns into our system of ODE. So it gets pretty complicated, right? Now we have to be doing this in a in a reacting flow simulation on top of all of the fluid dynamics calculations. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip through that. So how do we represent these models? I just wanted to show kind of a little bit of the, the nitty gritty kind of behind the scenes. We actually represent these using these model files. So this is a traditional way of showing this known as Kempkin. This is going to play. The reason I'm showing this is it's going to connect to some of the some of the work we've done um, and these details matter a little bit. So you end up with all you know this sort of fixed you know plain text format representing these these model of the species and then all the reactions and then we have certain rates um, and and uh, 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 parameters that show up in how we represent the reaction rates. Um, this is how we calculate the thermodynamics of the species. We have these um, 14 coefficient polynomials, which is how we get like specific heat and internal energy and entropy. So we just have these essentially this this evolved from the punch card format of Fortran back in the day. And so we have these these kind of fixed format numbers associated with all the species. Again, that's gonna it's gonna play a role a little bit later. So I just wanted to give you some of those behind the scenes. These days. We do have some more modern modern tools that are not quite as limited as these like fixed format cards. And Cantera, which is a project that, that I'm a, affiliated with, um, is an open source tool that um, it's written in C++, but it has interfaces in Python, MATLAB, and other things. It's used in combustion and all sorts of other um, problems involving reacting flows, electrochemistry, batteries, that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll talk, come back to that a little bit later. I just wanted to mention this. Um, these days, you know, we have a little bit more flexibility with how we represent these models. Still have to use these same uh, all these numbers, these parameters that get fixed and they have a certain you know, number of significant digits um, and we have to keep track of all these things in order to get these in order to get accurate models. Again, that will play a little bit of a role. Um, but this, the, the information that we use to represent the models, even though it's changed in format, is still the same basically. So one challenge with these before I even get into the computational cost is the models are kind of hard to develop and keep accurate because Right, you think about the way these might get created. You know, over the last couple of decades, they get shared via journal papers or on you know databases. Um, there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of things to keep track of. You know, we might have a model with 50 to 100 chemical species, and then hundreds and thousands of reactions. And there's a lot of numbers and a lot of things to keep track of. And one challenge is that it, the uh, maintaining the quality of these models is actually fairly hard because um, people put out different models. They might tweak certain you know parameters to, to make their models a little bit more accurate. And then um, what we find if we in, in one study that I did with some collaborators is we actually looked at the models that were published. And this is actually from just a few years ago from 13 different models that were presented at a, a big com uh, international com uh, conference on combustion. And we found that even though you know, we're looking at modern models, we had for the same species the same chemical species, uh, of a lot of discrepancies in terms of the enthalpies of formation. We had some that spanned very, very large um, uh, uh, values. And then also the rates um, of reactions, we had some that disagreed by over 10 times. So we're talking that what's supposed to be the same species and the same reactions, but in different models, they were different. So I'm not even talking about computational costs, just keeping the models accurate um, in a field with lots of people working around the world is, is a challenge. Um, so one question is, does this matter, right? We have these discrepancies. Does it play a big role? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, this is the, the part of the reason why is because we have these models and data that are shared in very inconsistent ways. Um, and it's hard to actually compare these. We're, we're doing lots of simulations and lots of experiments, but it's actually hard to, to compare the models and the data harder than it should be. Um, again, and it all comes back to the original format and how these were shared, right? We use these kind of very, very condensed 
fixed punch card formats. And so it's you can imagine it's pretty easy to make mistakes or to you know for discrepancies to appear and then hard to keep track of them. One challenge is that there's no formal convention for species names, right? You look at that um, thing in the upper left there that's highlighted, CH3, CHO, CHO, right? Somebody else might be using a different n name, a different mod uh, different moniker for that same species, right? So one thing that we can do is is look at these um, the structure of the different species. And then, you know, what we see actually, if we do this and we compare different models, is that that's the same species, but it's got different names and different and different models. So that's what leads to some of these discrepancies is there's no real consistent naming scheme and people come up with creative naming schemes that is sort of specific to their own personal you know, personal preferences. So that's one challenge. Um, that's something that that some collaborators and I have worked on is trying to look at you know the chemical knowledge we have. Like, okay, what is this molecule based on its the the atoms that it contains and its structure, and then trying to identify and and um, de uh, uh, you know translate essentially this these whatever names people gave to them identify oh this is actually the same species as this other one and let's make sure that the data actually are consistent between these different models so we did this we were looking um, we, we had a study a few years ago where we, where we looked at n-butanol as one particular fuel and we compared a variety of versions of, of um, these models and identified these discrepancies we found that you know these substitutions of parameters in different models could lead to variations in, in calculations of ignition time, which is kind of relevant to internal combustion engines, by as much as 10 times, right? So having these discrepancies can actually play a pretty significant role. So that's one, one challenge we haven't really resolved. We've just sort of pointed out as a problem and we're tr continuing to work on, you know, how can we make this better? How can we make it easier to have more consistent models moving forward? So, you know, aside from the challenges I just talked about, um, you know, we do have, we do need detailed chemical models, right? These models that have all the different species, all the different reactions in order to get accurate calculations of things like flame speeds, um, the, uh, uh, the ignition delay times, things like that that are relevant to all sorts of applications. So aside from the problems that I already talked about related to, 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 um, to, to data and the models, the other challenge is, the size and complexity of the models. So this and this leads to um, a significant time required for performing simulations. To get, so to give one example from a few years ago, um, and I just picked that because you know the data was easy or the the, the they report at the times and not everybody does. Um, there was a, a study done of a diesel spray. So inside the the combustion chamber, they were trying to do a simulation of the injection process followed by the combustion, like the form of the of the flame or the evolution of the flame in a in a diesel engine. And they were using a, a, what's known as a large eddy simulation, which is a particular kind of uh, computational fluid fluid dynamic simulation to capture turbulence. They used they were looking at endodecane, which is a, a a particular um, a chemical that's sometimes used to represent diesel. Like that's you know there's an approximation there that I'll talk about maybe about maybe more later. It used it was a relatively compact model, only had 54 chemical species, and on the order of hundreds of reactions, which may seem like a lot, but is actually on the small side. Um, so trying to perform that simulation right of the fairly complicated, you know, multiple phenomena. We've got injection of a liquid that's atomizing and vaporizing and then combusting. So there's a lot going on. And but because of the uh, complexity of the model representing the fuel oxidation, it took just to calculate two milliseconds after the start of injection, it took 48,000 CPU core hours, which is a pretty long time considering the real time it's simulating is only two milliseconds, right? So if we want to approach anything like, you know, multi-cycle engine simulations, anything that's, you know, a little bit longer than that, we start to get into very, very long computational times. So the the main challenge that some of the work we've we've been doing for years now is to try to reduce that right we want to capture the detailed complex phenomena um, that are relevant to for example simulating an engine or simulating you know a burning fire of a building or of a tree um, they're very complicated and we need this sort of we need that detail in the chemistry but it just leads to significant time required to perform simulations right if you're somebody who's working at Siemens or you know GE or wherever somebody you know where you're working on say an engine or maybe you're trying to perform simulations of a building or or maybe even a wildfire and trying to see how you know where is this wildfire going to go we're trying to do some simulations that are really on demand you can't wait this long to do those things right you need to you need to get a, an answer back and not you know 
days or weeks or even months in some cases. Or maybe you're working at a company that doesn't have access to a supercomputer, right? The way that, that people at national labs do or some academics do. So the time involved in performing these simulations is really, really challenging. So why is it challenging? Well, it's challenging due to two main reasons, stiffness and size. And I'll talk a little bit about these both. Um, so chemical kinetic models um, that, just, that, that describe the species and reactions exhibit high levels of, of stiffness, which may be something that you've talked about, you know, if it may be familiar from your numerical methods classes if you're talking about time integration. So stiffness comes from a wide range of, of time scales. And so this is an this is a plot of, of the characteristic creation time scales in methane. Again, methane's a pretty small model. There's not a ton of, of chemical species. And we see that the characteristic times go from on the order of 10 to the negative two seconds all the way down to 10, 10 to the negative nine seconds. We're talking like nanoseconds. And so um, if you have creation times which are that tiny, then um, uh, you know that's going to lead to needing to use time steps when you're doing your time integration that are really really small. And if you don't, then you know your simulation could become unsteady and blow unstable and blow up. So so this high stiffness is a challenge. Um, and so this comes from again these wide range of time scales, and that's really due to the fact that we have these radical species really really reactive. They're being created, they're being destroyed, they're kind of bouncing around at really really short time scales. And we have reverse reactions that are happening in both directions, meaning they're both, you know, the reactants are producing the products and also happening in the backward direction, things going back at really, really short time scales. Um, and so traditionally, this requires implicit integration. There's some exceptions to that, which I'm not, you know, like uh, really, really high speed flows or direct numerical simulations where you're using really short time scales to integrate anyways. But most of the time, practical simulations require what's known as implicit integration algorithms as opposed to explicit. So um, uh, one challenge or, or one potential solution to this challenge is that, well, maybe we don't always need those, right? That's kind of been the convention for, for a couple of decades now. Um, but in a real simulation, like multi, you know, 3D reacting flow simulation, there are lots of regions where there's things that things are not reacting very, very rapidly, or they may already be at equilibrium. And so some of the work that we've done has been looking at, well, can we actually kind of dynamically use different integrators at different locations in the simulation? So this shows some of the potential for that um, from some work I did a little while ago, looking at um, different potential integrators. So as opposed to the ones that have been traditionally used, and we found that you could see really significant speed up, like on the order of 50 to 60 times um, for doing the same problem, but on um, using a different integrator, potentially using different computational hardware, right? So not only looking at different me uh, numerical methods, but then also um, trying to strategize on using different, like not just a CPU on your computer, but then maybe the GPU. So uh, we found that when the chemistry is maybe moderately stiff, um, we could potentially use different algorithms to to uh, to make the simulations run much faster, as opposed to just what was used traditionally for for these stability region, reasons. So stiffness is one major challenge, um, and and there's ways of of working on that, both on modifying the model and then also using different integration algorithms. The other main challenge is in size, so size of the model. So I showed you that that hydrogen model, which uh, you know has a number of species and and reactions. So again, hydrogen is is kind of the, one of the simplest fuels we can consider. Now, if we look at more complicated fuels like hydrocarbons, you know, methane, we look at alcohols, we start to look at larger larger models, and we see that these models have gotten really really big. This is a log log plot, and so we're looking at models that are on the order of hundreds or thousands of species and thousands and tens of thousands of reactions. And especially in the last, you know, 50, well, 15 years now, I guess, um, they've gotten really, really big. And so the problem is, is that the transportation fuels like gasoline, diesel, jet fuels, rocket propellant, things that, that are really relevant to, to, you know, we want to make engines cleaner, we want to make them more efficient, we need to simulate these sorts of fuels. Um, and the models are just massive. So, so that's a big challenge. One thing that we can do is is um, reduce those models, right? That's that's one potential strategy is to say, okay, the the chemistry people have made these really big. As engineers, we are comfortable with you know some level of of approximation, right? We know that we don't need a perfect answer; we just need it within some tolerance, so we can reduce the model and and maybe make it approximate with some acceptable error. Um, we can, you know, addressing the stiffness challenge, we can um, modify the models specifically to remove stiffness or re reduce stiffness. 
Um, we can do things like tabulate answers rather than having to do a full integration. Um, or we can actually look at the integration algorithms themselves and try to make, you know, use ones that are maybe more efficient, especially maybe more, more efficient on some of the modern computational hardware like GPUs that are used uh, a lot these days. So some, so a lot of the work that my, that my group and I have done have focused on a, on a couple of these strategies, um, particularly the first two I'll talk about next. So just to give an overview um, of some of these methods. So to, to simplify the models, what we can do is, is what's called skeletal reduction, which is just to say, okay, I have all of these reactions, all of these species, uh, you know, all, some of them are, are more important under certain conditions, like different temperature, pressure ranges. And so um, if we know, okay, I'm only going to be performing simulations under these particular ranges of conditions, I can just get rid of some things, right? And there will be some error associated with that. But, you know, if I'm careful, that error is within what I'm comfortable with, right? Maybe 10%. And I know, well, experimentally, I can't get an answer that's better than that anyways. So I'm, I'm okay with my model being, um, being having some error associated with it. Um, in general, we find that that you know a single strategy like just removing those species or just using one method to remove species by itself may not be sufficient. And so we look at you know combining a variety of strategies um, using different methods to you know just try to make that model as small as we can because honestly, you know people make I mentioned these like thousand species chemical models. Um, so the people uh, who are more on the simulation side who are doing the CFD say, oh, I can only handle 50 to 100 species. So you have to kind of use it, use every tool in your arsenal to try to make that model smaller um, uh, just because there's so much detail in it. In it. So the other thing we can do is is um, try to reduce stiffness by eliminating the tiny time scales. And so I showed that that range of, of creation time scales for methane. So we have certain methods that can actually uh, eliminate the shortest ones. So that's a matter of getting rid of those short ones. And then we don't maybe need the same sort of integration algorithms that we originally did if we've gotten rid of the short tiny time scales. So um, the strategy that, that my group and I have, have developed in the past is, again, in using multiple tools because we really just have to make it smaller, eliminate all those all that stiffness. And so we use a, a variety of strategies. This shows you know, a flowchart of the overall process. Um, and so the skeletal reduction stage has to do with getting rid of species by either eliminating or combining them. Um, so one, one, you know, we we work on eliminating the species. We work on eliminating reactions that are not important, and then we look at are there isomers that we can sort of lump together and represent just as a single thing, as opposed to keeping track of all the separate isomers. Um, and then there's a separate stage, which is um, to reduce those those tiny time scales. So I'll talk a little bit about some of these. I'm keeping an eye on the time. Um, so one method um, to, to, to walk through it in a little bit of detail, the, the name is a bit wordy. It's the directed relation graph with error propagation. And how it actually works is by taking our system of species and reactions and turning it into a graph, like representing it like a graph. Where each of the nodes on that graph represent all the species, the different you know, molecules that are in the model. And then we have a dependency you know, with these arrows, which says, OK, if A is my fuel, B is maybe, uh, you know, if A, if A is hydrogen, H2, maybe B is H. And so A, hydrogen, depends on H to actually uh, represent itself in the model, right? If we remove B from the model, it would, it would cause a large error in A. So that's how we're sort of representing dependence. So we have these arrows connecting nodes in the graph whenever species participate in reactions together. So it's a way of both representing and then quantifying the dependence of things in the model. Um, it's, so it's mostly used as a, as a method for eliminate, identifying you know, how, how important certain things are, um, not so much a physical model for representing the, the, um, the, the, sp the species, but more as a tool to, to, to doing this reduction. So we can calculate, we can actually quantify these dependents between zero and one. So zero means there's nothing, there's no, no edge. One would be, these are really, really important to each other. And then we can start to look at, um, OK, in this graph, something that's, that's far away, like E to A, is going to be less important. And that's going to be like a, you know, it, it's going to be these numbers between 0 and 1 that are multiplying each other. So the dependence of E on A might actually be very tiny. So maybe you can completely eliminate it from the system because it's farther away on the graph and the value is pretty tiny. So we end up by using this method getting for each of the species in our model some value that we can used to, to rank the importance of all the species and then we compare it to some cutoff threshold which is a small number like 0.01 and then say okay is this are these importance values 
smaller. And if they are, then we can get rid of it from the model. And then all this, all the reactions that that species participated in. So now we've we've trimmed the size and made it a little bit smaller. So we have to do this in an automated way, you know, using some some you know, okay, 10% error, 30% error, whatever we're comfortable with. And so the algorithm would then look at all these species and do this until until it hits some error limit. Um, there's another method known as sensitivity analysis, which is a bit more a bit more brute force, where we're actually looking at each of the species that are left one by one and removing them from the model and seeing, OK, what error in terms of performing simulations does this does this um, induce? And so we would do that, identify, OK, well, this um, hydrogen peroxide at the bottom there induces only one percent error. That's pretty tiny, right? That's within the you know tolerance of most experimental measurements. So let's we can totally get rid of that, right? So then we're, we're going to do the same thing over again. That's where the greedy part of this algorithm shows up. So now we're going to go back and, and reevaluate the remaining species. OK, now how does the removal of each of these in, you know, increase the error? OK, HO2, that only um, increases it by 5%. That's still within our limit of 10. OK, now we do the same thing over and over again. And now we see, oh, no, no, um, these are all, I mean, if you're familiar with hydrogen, these are both, these are all really important radicals. Um, and so, yeah, we can't remove any of those without making the error jump up quite significantly. If we tried to, it would go above our limit and therefore we have to, you know, we keep that one in the model. So this just gives a quick overview of some of the models that we, or the methods that we've developed to, re to um, reduce the size of our models. Um, just to give an example about, you know, what this actually looks like in practice, um, a few years ago we had a study taking this multi-step reduction approach to a model for gasoline. So, how do we actually represent gasoline, something like gasoline? You know, if you were, if you were to go to um, your, you know, your gas station and take a sample of, you know, 87 octane gasoline and you were to put it into some, you know, some equipment for determining what was inside it, you would see that it is a complex mixture of all sorts of hydrocarbons, right? It's it's a, this blend, this spectrum of all sorts of different things. And what makes it challenging is that if you were to come back to the same gas station in a week, or if you were to go to a different gas station across the country and do the same sort of test, it wouldn't be the exact same thing, right? Gasoline is not actually a fixed mixture of things. Neither is diesel, neither are jet fuels or rocket propellant. They're, they, they're designed to meet certain performance measures like octane number, um, but the actual components can change. That makes it very challenging to model because, you know, how do you come up with a model for something where the composition is not even really fixed or known? So we use meth. So one of the strategies that people have come up with is creating what's known as a surrogate. So um, and there's, you know, there's a this is still a pretty an active area of research is how do we actually represent and create models for these things? So this is one approach. So the surrogate for gasoline um, uh, that I was examining used uh, four different components. So n-heptane, isooctane, toluene, and then another component called 2-pentene in these percentages. And so that was designed um, in, to try to match the performance of gasoline in terms of, you know, its, its octane performance, but also its like viscosity, its density, things like that. So um, the, the, the challenge though is we, we you know, and I'm using the word challenge a lot because there are lots of challenges, is once we have this mixture of things, we have just a really large and complex chemical model. So the, the mechanism or the model that describes this surrogate for gasoline had about 1,400 species and 6,000 reactions. So if you want to do a simulation of, you know, a gasoline engine, maybe you're working on some new high efficiency um, compression ignition type gasoline engine, which, you know, Mazda, I think, came out with it a few years ago. You really need that detailed chemistry, but you can't perform a CFD simulation with something with 1400 species. It's just, it would take, you know, your, your computer would crawl to a halt and years later you might get an answer, but it's just, it's way too complex and large um, for even like a, a reasonable supercomputer. So we needed to try to reduce this. So um, because, uh, and, and what's, what's more is that even making a single reduced model that would be relevant to all conditions would still probably be too large. So the strategy that, that I came up with was to actually use two different targets. So come up with multiple reduced models for different applications. Hi. Sorry, Siri thought I was, I was talking to it. Um, 
So um, the two different targets I came up with were targeting, like I mentioned, these kind of uh, advanced compression ignition engines. So one one technology is known as homogeneous charge compression ignition. Um, that's tip that's lower temperature combustion. And then the the other target was a more traditional um, higher temperature, like spark ignition or compression ignition engine. So a more traditional type. So the difference is mainly one is more lean and low temperature. The other one is more like a, a mix stoichiometric mixture and high temperature. So those different ranges of conditions would lead to different reduced models. So just to give an example, I want to show the results for the kind of traditional spark ignition engine. Um, and so what we what, what we were able to do is by taking our starting model with about 1400 species, first using this like multi-pronged strategy to get rid of stuff with an error limit of 10%, which is actually not, not high, certainly, you know, in, in engineering kind of, uh, you know, approximation that we're pretty comfortable with, we were able to, or I was able to eliminate um, a large number of those species to get it down to just under 100. And then by doing some additional steps to remove that stiffness, which I call the reduced model versus the skeletal, we're able to get it down to about 80 species. So starting at like 1400 all the way down to like 80, which is something that's much more usable in a in a uh, in a like a real CFD simulation, a real computational fluid dynamic simulation. Um, and then, you know, one thing we have to do is is verify whether these these kind of modified tiny models are able to still capture the performance of the original one. This shows calculations of ignition delay. So that's you take your fuel and oxidizer at some temperature and pressure. You represent it as if it's just in some contained volume and you see how long it takes to ignite for different temperatures. That's the ignition delay time. And so you can see, you know, these plots show that these even though these models have have gotten rid of a ton of stuff, they're still able to capture the the performance, um, the, the calculations associated with the detailed model with a lot, you know, pretty, pretty reasonable accuracy. Right. You can barely distinguish um, the, the results here. So that's where that 10 percent error comes from. It's pretty tiny. Same thing with um, these are in a, in, a, in a reactor. If you were to have something mixing for a certain amount of time before coming out, um, depending on that residence time, you get a different temperature. That's this is also kind of an important phenomenon. You want to make sure your models can capture. And we see that, you know, these these detailed, the detailed and the tiny models are able to, to perform the same or generate the same phenomena. And then the, sometimes the hardest one is a is a laminar flame speed. This is if you had a box with your mixture of fuel and oxidizer and you, you kind of ignited it on one side, what's the speed at which a laminar flame would propagate through that box? Um, another thing that can be challenging to, to capture with a, a reduced model, but we get pretty good performance um, uh, again, within that 10% error uh, with these tiny models. So um, that's something that we've been be pretty successful at is coming up with these kind of combined strategies to take the large models and reduce them. Um, the more recent work on this topic has been um, in developing open source software. So we've developed a, a package called PyMars. Um, MARS stands for Model Automatic Reduction Software. Um, so this is actually a project that has mostly been led by undergraduate students in my group. Um, and so they've developed um, over the years now this Python based package that combines a variety of methods um, and it can be pretty easily you know, installed and applied to these, these models. Um, so in terms of cost reduction, right, I've talked about these first two and then I also want to talk a little bit about the integration algorithms. Again, keeping an eye on time. So um, I mentioned already that traditionally handling these, uh, the chemistry has required implicit algorithms and implicit algorithms to, to dive into the details of the numerical methods, they require some, some pretty costly things. So they give us the benefit of we don't have any stability problems. We don't have to take, you know, nanosecond time steps but they are complicated, right? And so they involve um, evaluating the Jacobian matrix, which has to do with partial derivatives of your, of your um, ODE. Um, and that, that's pretty costly in terms of how many evaluations. So it, in order to get that Jacobian matrix, traditionally um, you have to do a quadratic, um, uh, uh, or excuse me, the cost scales quadratically, meaning if you have N species, so 10 species, the cost of getting that Jacobian is N squared or 100. So it's it's a you know, so if your model gets really large, the cost of this step gets really, really big. Um, and you also have to factorize the Jacobian matrix once you've evaluated and that cost is N cubed. So that's even bigger. So if it was 100, now the cost would be 1000. So these steps involved in the implicit algorithms can be very, very costly, which really just means to, if we use these algorithms with a large model, this is where that computational cost kind of comes from, right? It's due to these steps. 
So, you know, one of the things that we've we've worked on for a few years and are continuing to work on are, well, how can we how can we still take our models, whatever the size is now, say we've already reduced it, um, but we want to further reduce the cost. Well, we can maybe work on trying to eliminate these ex expensive steps. So one thing is um, working on um, uh, recognizing that many of the, the Jacobian matrix is sparse and maybe we can um, evaluate it analytically, meaning if we have information we know about the chemistry, we, we don't need to use like a brute force um, finite difference evaluation. We can actually come up with the exact equations associated with that Jacobian matrix. So that can reduce cost. And then instead of using a method that requires both of these steps, maybe we can t uh, examine alternate algorithms. We can find things that are better suited for kind of the modern uh, computing hardware like GPUs. And that's where a lot of the work that my group has been doing is has been focused on those steps. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about parallelism for a second because, um, you know, this is where a lot of work these days in terms of, of performing simulations and numerical methods, we there's been sort of a game change. And if you're familiar with GPUs and like, you know, cryptocurrency, you know that GPUs are really big these days. Um, and that's happened over the last 10 or 15 years. It used to be that you had a CPU um, and maybe if you were developing a computing cluster to, to run big simulations, you just had you know, your CPU that had a bunch of cores and then you made a, a computing cluster that connected these. So that's where the distributed distributed computing kind of uh, term comes from. And then each, core, each uh, CPU has multiple cores. So in order to keep up with demand for increasing performance, that by itself, just using CPUs on a cluster is not enough. And so we've really moved towards towards uh, 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 GPUs, which relies on a method known as um, SIMD and SIMT, so single instruction multi multi data, single instruction multi uh, thread. So these GPUs, which is what this is really referring to, have gotten really important for scientific computing. It's also meant that when you know people who are mining uh, cryptocurrency buy all the GPUs up, the computing clusters for national labs have challenges to get there. You know when they're making new machines because the entire market is is you know taken up by cryptocurrency miners. So um, what this looks like are things like GPUs, um, for example. So a GPU, if you're not familiar, stands for Gra Graphics Processing Unit, um, and it was originally developed to display pixels, right? To make your the stuff appear on your screen really fast. Um, they've really evolved to favor throughput, meaning doing things, uh, a lot of things, like a fire hose, as opposed to um, latency, which means doing something really fast. Um, and, and so that evolution has led to this massive uh, parallelism. So I like to say that a CPU is sort of like Hulk, is able to do you know a small number of things very fast, very powerful, whereas a GPU is this kind of group of, of, of independent units that all work. Maybe they're, they're doing a tiny thing by themselves, but together they're doing a large number of things at the same time. Some of the challenges that, that it comes with with uh, using GPUs is known as thread divergence. So that means if you have in your in your code, if you have lots of things where maybe different initial conditions could lead to different paths being followed, that leads to something called thread divergence, which can make your GPU go really slow. So that's one of the challenges. You know, these are really great. They have lots of parallelism, but there's lots of challenges associated with with how do we actually implement things. So what we want is to somehow structure our codes such that if we have a GPU, it's doing things that are all following the same path, which means really practically we have to, you know, we cannot use some of the same algorithms that we've used before. Um, so yeah, where this really shows up is in these these implicit algorithms that we use. Um, they're they're very complex, and we can't use them. Um, so one of the things that we've looked at are can we use maybe different algorithms that somehow can still handle that that um, stiffness, but don't have the same don't have the same um, complexity associated with an implicit algorithm. So you know some of the things we've looked at are for different kinds of chemistry, like using a specific type of integrator. Um, without, I want to get into the details of these different methods, but it's taking your maybe your traditional Runga Kutta methods, and then there's some modifications of them. So this Runga Kutta Cash Carp, Runga Kutta Chebyshev, they're just trying to make them um, more efficient or uh, handle stiffness a bit better. So we looked at taking these different algorithms and then testing them on both CPUs and GPUs to see which which may be the best. Um, so we could see that you know depending on your chemistry. Uh, on a GPU, you could get pretty good speed up. So on the order of, uh, you, you know, two orders of magnitude, performing the same thing on a, on a CPU versus a GPU. Um, so in that case, it was using all the cores on the GPU, the, or on the CPU, the GPU was still 25 times faster. And then if we looked at kind of chemistry that had some stiffness, uh, 
um, we still saw a speed up of on the order of an order of magnitude, so 13 times at, um, at, at worst, really. Um, and uh, uh, well, it, this so this is actually comparing a traditional algorithm. So vode is a type of implicit algorithm that might be used traditionally. If we compare that versus using this kind of more efficient algorithm, we could get a speed up. So the, the simulation could run up to maybe 60 times faster at best. So some of the current research thrusts in this area, and I, I am noticing we're getting close to nine o'clock. Um, I'm pretty much done with, I'm going to wrap up my talk here in a second. Um, some of our current research for us are taking some of the work we've done in the past and now incorporating it into this open source package, Cantera, so that others can, can easily take advantage of the research. And so some of this is in speeding up implicit integration by, by taking those Jacobi matrices and doing things known as preconditioning, which means trying to, to simplify some of the linear algebra to make it faster. Um, and we're also looking at extending these these uh, model reduction tools again to make maybe have them apply to different kinds of chemistry like heterogeneous like catalysis and other things where it's not just pure gas phase chemistry and also just making them more more powerful tools. So to conclude a little bit about some of the work we've done, and I'm gonna, I still ha have some slides I wanna show about some of the other projects in my group. Um, we have developed these tools to take large, large models with thousands of species to reduce them, you know, on the order of a hundred. Um, but the problem is, is that the models just keep getting bigger <laughs> because we keep making these uh, surrogate models with, with more and more species, more and more reactions. And so they just continue to get larger and we can only work, so, you know, only reduce them so much. And so the path forward that we've been pursuing is, is combining all these different strategies, like reducing the models, reducing the stiffness, trying to identify more efficient algorithms, basically doing whatever we can to try to make the cost more manageable towards folks who are, you know, on the engineering side who just need to run an accurate simulation. So I briefly want to talk about some of the other projects just to kind of summarize and give you an idea. This is this is one thrust of, of my research group, but we do have a variety of other projects in related and then kind of totally different areas. Um, and so the group themes are, are somewhat on the reacting flow combustion modeling side, which is mostly what I've talked about. We also have some projects that are more general numerical methods for computational fluid dynamics. Um, in the last couple of years, some of the other application areas that we've moved into are looking at the ocean and um, the biogeochemistry, which has to do with both the, um, the bio biological processes and also things like carbonate formation. So it's a complex interconnected network of chemistry and biology. Um, and coupled with turbulent flow in the ocean. Um, we also have some projects looking at smoldering combustion wildfires. And then I personally have a strong interest in open science. So I wanna talk a lot, just about maybe one or two of the projects in these areas. So one thing is, you know, I talked a lot about the chemistry and the, you know, the, the species and the reactions, but another thing that's really important in, in turbulent chem combustion is the transport. So I talked about the chemistry, but diffusion is also really important. And so one project that's, um, you know, one of my former students as well as some collaborators and I have been looking at are the models used for diffusion. Because when you have a large number of, of molecules, you have to think about, well, how do these interact with each other, right? If you have hundreds of species, there's different ways of representing the diffusion and the sort of cross diffusion, differential diffusion between different components. So, um, one thing that we really examined was, well, there's been a traditional model that's been assumed that's used in the in the combustion community, but nobody, nobody ever really evaluated whether it was a good model. <laughs> it was just sort of the best we could do. So um, that's known as the mixture average model, which basically approximates diffusion as, you know, you have maybe 100 species. It says, OK, if I'm looking at the diffusion of one of those, I'm only going to compare it against the mixture as a whole. In reality, each of the components has a different diffusion, you know, different uh, different levels of diffusion with respect to all the other components. That's known as the multi-component approach, which is the kind of more truer physics. Um, and so one of the studies that we did was looking at, well, you know, the first one is a model. Actually, they're both models. Everything's a model. But one of them is a, is a more approximate model. And so we wanted to see, well, does that actually make a difference, right? How important is that that approximation, that assumption? So um, what we looked at, so this is actually showing um, the uh, species flux 
um, uh, in, a, in a flame using these two different approaches. So the one on the top is the more approximate one. The one on the bottom is the more exact one. And it's hard to see that, you know, but there are some differences in this, this flow field. And what this actually contributes to is a difference in, so this, this is a more kind of statistical way of showing the differences for three different fuels, um, hydrogen, uh, N-heptane and toluene. And we can see if we look at the statistics of in the overall fuel field, um, this is the, uh, on the left is the mass fraction of fuel. And it's a, this is a conditional mean conditioned on the temperature. And on the right is the, um, the, the source term. So sort of the reaction rate of the fuel, also a conditional mean um, conditioned on temperature a normalized temperature. And so you can see that the, the different colors, the different trend lines are these two different models. And so you do see some differences, especially if you look at the one on the right. Um, and so we see some differences. And the question is, well, that, does it actually matter? So one global quantity is the turbulent flame speed. So this is uh, the turbulent um, analog to the laminar flame speed. So this is if you have, again, like a, a, a flame in a box and it's turbulent, how quickly does it move through that box? And that's got a lot of applications relevant to, to things like combustion, you know, engine combustion. So these show for the three different fuels, a comparison of the turbulent flame speeds. Now, it shouldn't lie, they shouldn't lie on top of each other because this is an incredibly turbulent, you know, it's turbulent, there's a lot of ran randomness. And so the question is, well, is the mean, is the average value over time consistent? And we see that actually it's it's not. And we see some differences like on the order of 13%, 20%. The toluene case was a little bit lower, but um, still, still noticeable. So we do see differences in this like global quantity just by changing the model for diffusion. So that sort of led to some awareness of like, okay, well, if you're using this, the simpler model, because it's less expensive, less computationally expensive, just be aware that that's going to lead to an error in your model. And you should be aware of and honest about about your errors and your approximations. So um, an, a, one other kind of just to change gears completely um, is looking at, well, in doing general fluid dynamic simulations, if you have a big domain, the way that we typically parallelize this is by decomposing that domain into different cubes and then sending each of those cubes, if it's a 3D problem, to different uh, computer, you know, different computer. And so one of the things we've looked at is trying to come up with novel ways of doing that decomposition such that you can reduce the amount of communication required. Um, and just because of time, I'm going to I'm going to not spend too much time on this one. Um, moving on to the sort of applications, I've talked a lot about methods, um, but we also do study phenomena itself. So one of those is is smoldering. So smoldering is the flameless combustion inside a solid fuel. So you think about like a cigarette burning or a um, in a campfire, you know, the wood may still have those embers that are burning, even though there's no no visible flame. So that's that's smoldering. So smoldering, in, especially in wood fuels, woody fuels, has not been as well studied as the sort of gas phase flame combustion. So, but it's really important, especially in wildfires, because um, it can contribute to the flame. It can cause a much bigger fire, or it can persist for much longer times. Um, so one of the things we've had a, a project going on for a few years, which is a collaboration between my group and then some folks on the experimental side here at Oregon State and then also in the Forest Service is looking in, in depth at the smoldering and trying to understand what controls the ignition of smoldering and also the propagation of smoldering. So we've looked at all these different combinations of, of fuels. They all consist of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, but in different levels. So this shows an example of sort of a, an overall plot of the smoldering process um, uh, with time and in depth. So you can see over time, as it burns, it gets hot, and then it starts to con, con, you know, con, uh, condense because it's turning into ash and, and char. So one of the things we've looked at recently is, well, um, how does the fuel con, fuel composition, so if you look at different fuels, how does that change ignition? And so we see that based on a given heat flux, different, different fuels, as you might expect, but people haven't necessarily accounted for this, they, uh, it changes how long it takes uh, for the ignition to occur. So that means that different fuels, if they have an ignition source, some of them may last longer before they ignite. And so we wanted to, to quantify how much that, that was. Um, again, moving a little bit different different direction, um, a project that, that's been a collaboration with some folks at, at University of Colorado uh, Boulder is looking at um, okay, taking what we know from combustion, where fluids and chemistry all sort of cu couple in a very complicated way, the same thing happens in the ocean. It's not combustion, but there's different kinds of chemical reactions. So some of the things we've looked at are, are recognizing that, you know, if we think about these really big picture climate models that include the ocean, a lot of them have not necessarily accounted for this coupling between the, the, the flow and the, the chemistry. 
And so um, we found that actually you do need to account for that coupling. And so if you want to, for example, calculate how much CO2 enters the ocean, which is a pretty important in the carbon budget worldwide, you need to include this coupling. Otherwise, you could um, you could over or under um, under approximate how much that's happening. So now what we're looking at is actually more on the bi the bio side. So now we're thinking about, well, how do these this chemistry actually connect to the life that's in the ocean? And it's all very mo much more complicated and, and, and connected than it is in, in the atmosphere. And so we're looking at these what's known as biogeochemical models, um, and they have the same sort of problem as in combustion. They get really large, and so we want to do um, high detail CFD simulations, but we need to reduce the models. So we're taking some of the work we've done in the combustion world and applying it to this, this problem. Um, uh, on the open science side of things, one of the other efforts that I'm involved with, and I just kind of sort of want to make you aware of this, is, you know, people write a lot of code to do research these days. Um, my group, pretty much everybody writes some sort of code. Um, and some of those packages, you don't necessarily get credit for that in the academic world. So an effort that I've been involved with over the last five years is as a journal that we created to actually review and publish open source software for research. So um, JOS, the Journal of Open Source Software, has been around for about five years now. We've published almost 2,000 papers where people are, you're actually writing, you're, you know, you're submitting your software and maybe a short article about it. And then the, the people review it and actually review the software. Um, so that, if that's something you're curious about, I would you know, encourage you to check out. We also wrote a paper about it a few years ago. So with, with that, I just want to wrap up by saying that you know, my group, uh, we have a variety of different themes, and I just wanted to, to stop and pause and say, well, what actually combines these? And well, if you notice, we have the work that's in the fire. We have the work that's a little bit on the, the kind of aerodynamics on the air side, a little bit of ocean. Um, Earth, and then the open science. And so it turns out my group is actually somewhat connected by Captain Planet, which I'm realizing may now be older than, than some of the people in the audience. So maybe that's a bit dated joke now. So with that, I'll say thank you. And I realize I went a little bit over my intended time. Um, and if we have any, any quick questions, I'd be happy to answer them.